are going to take a trip tonight to the dark side of the universe. Of all the topics that we cover in astronomy, this is probably the one that fascinates me the most. It's something that's not very well known. It's, one of the, it's probably the greatest mystery right now in the universe. And scientists have been trying to crack this code down for the better part of the century. And here's how it breaks down. 85% of the mass content of the universe is made up of mysterious matter that has not been detected yet. Everything that we're experiencing right now in this room and that you experience in reality with your five sentences or senses, from the atoms and molecules that make up your bodies to the, the material that makes up this desk, the, the, the chairs, the desks in this room, the, the photons of light coming out of the light fixtures, the blue sky, the sun, the stars, galaxies, everything that we experience accounts for a very small percentage of the total mass content of the universe. 26% of the mass energy content of the universe is dark matter. 85% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation in any way, shape, or form. The only way we can detect dark matter is gravitationally. And it's never been detected. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Here's how it breaks down. The mass energy content of the universe, 21% is dark matter. 75% is a mysterious dark energy that's actually causing the universe to expand. And this very small sliver right here is normal matter, 4%. And of this 4%, 0.4% is made up of stuff that we can actually see. The majority of this 4% right here is actually interstellar gas and supermassive black holes. So the stuff that you and I experience from the, the, what we're made out of to what makes up everything in this room is 0.4% of 4% of the total mass energy content of the universe. 96% is either dark matter or dark energy. So let's take a little history lesson. Let's go back about 90 years, 1920s. Back then, the universe was essentially the Milky Way galaxy. That's all we could see. And astronomers assumed that the Milky Way was the universe. Technology was beginning to progress. Our knowledge of astronomy is directly proportional to advances in technology. So as technology progressed, people started to look in their telescopes and notice these little fuzzy patches. And they assumed that they were part of our Milky Way galaxy, which was the universe. Static, eternal universe. So everything is, you know, the universe never had a beginning. It was eternal. It was static. It wasn't moving in any way. That was kind of the perception of the universe in the 1920s. Einstein had just developed his general theory of relativity. It had been proven around 1921 due to a solar eclipse. And so the groundwork was laid for some major advances in astronomy. Then in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble did some work at uh, Mount Wilson, 2.5 meter Hooker telescope, and he was studying Cepheid variables in, in, in nebulas. The Andromeda Nebula is what it was called at that time. It was a fuzzy patch, assumed to be part of our, our uh, Milky Way galaxy. And Cepheid variables is a way of measuring, it's a standard candle, it's a way of measuring distance in the universe. So what Edwin Hubble discovered was that these fuzzy patches were actually much further away than what they could be in our Milky Way. So, he discovered that the universe is actually much bigger than the Milky Way galaxy. He completely blew our perception of the universe wide open. So overnight, we went from one galaxy, the Milky Way being the universe, to our, our universe is literally filled with thousands, millions, and now we know hundreds of trillions of galaxies because of Edwin Hubble. Then, and a few years later, a man named Fritz Zwicky, who was working at Caltech at that time, looked up at the neighboring coma cluster of galaxies, and he actually studied the motions of these galaxies within the cluster. And he used something called the Virial Theorem to actually measure the mass content of, these, of this galaxy cluster. And he came up with a very interesting result. So he measured the radial velocities of the galaxies at the edge of the cluster, and from that he was able to deduce what the mass of the cluster was. And then he compared that to the actual mass that could be observed. So here's the coma cluster of galaxies. 
It's in the constellation Coma Bernices, which is close to the bright star Rigel. Not a very sexy constellation. You can barely see it in the night sky. But it's one of those where if you look at it through a telescope, you'll see hundreds and thousands of galaxies. So there's about a thousand galaxies inside of the Coma Cluster. And what, what Fritz Wicke actually measured was that the mass, the average galactic mass of a galaxy inside of the Coma Cluster was about 4.5 times 10 to the 10 solar masses from the Virial Theorem. Now, you compare that to what you could actually see from the illuminated stuff inside of the Coma Cluster, and he came up with this result, 8.5 times 10 to the 7 solar masses being the average galactic luminosity. So we have a discrepancy between this number and this number right here. And that's where this puzzle begins. So the average mass to light ratio of the galaxies within the coma cluster was around 500, that ratio. Now, what that means is, if all of the matter that makes up the galaxies in the coma cluster was actually from the illuminated stuff, in other words, the stuff that you can see, that number right there should be closer to 1. Instead, it's 500, which is several orders of magnitude higher than expected. So what Fritz Wicke discovered was that there had to be a lot more mass in the galaxies making up that cluster than what could actually be seen in order to describe their rotations, their, mo their movements. In fact, he estimated there had to be about 90% more mass than what you could actually see. Now, this is 1933. It's only a few years after Edwin Hubble, Hubble's discovery. So the universe was brand new at that time. Astronomy was just starting to grow. People were just starting to explore the universe. So this concept of dark matter was not really being explored. So here are the galaxies in the Coma Cluster. What Fritz Wicke discovered was that there had to be a lot of missing matter in order to describe the motions of the galaxies within the coma cluster. However, this result was largely dismissed until later. Forty years later, Vera Rubin comes along. It's the 1970s, and she has the benefit of using more sophisticated technology, more sensitive photon detectors, and she was able to use advanced spectroscopic techniques to analyze the motions of individual galaxies. And what Rubin did was she actually measured the velocity of hydrogen gas clouds in the Andromeda galaxy using similar techniques, looking at the radial velocities. In other words, analyzing the Doppler shift, the redshift of the light. And what she found was something very interesting. What she, what she was actually analyzing Rubin and Ford, was the galaxy rotation. How fast does the material actually go around in a galaxy? And what she found was that galaxies need to have about 10 times more mass than visible mass in order to hold themselves together. So let's look at this. First of all, how do you measure mass in space? You can't take an object like a star or a galaxy and actually weigh it on a scale. You can't do that. What you have to do is you have to analyze its motion. So you have Newton and Einstein both developed theories of gravity. Newton's law of gravity, Einstein, of course, general relativity, which means that any body of matter, like the Earth or the Sun, actually curves space around it. But whether you're looking at Newtonian gravity or whether you're looking at Einstein's law of gravity, the gravitational force is inversely proportional to the distance. That's intuitive. We understand that. Distance is r big M, little m. So in a system like our solar system, where 99% of the mass is the sun, the gravity of the sun is going to pull on Mercury harder than it's going to pull on Pluto because Mercury is closer to the sun. So what that means is Mercury has to rotate around the sun, or revolve around the sun, faster than Pluto does because Mercury is closer to the sun. The sun is pulling on Mercury harder Therefore, Mercury has to move faster in order to stay in orbit around the Sun than Pluto, which moves slower. That's intuitive. We understand that. When you analyze a galaxy, like Andromeda, you would expect something very similar. 
because the bulk of the mass of the galaxy is in the center. That's where all the illuminated stuff is. If you look at a galaxy like Andromeda, the bright center indicates that there's likely more mass in the center of the galaxy than the spiral arms on the outer edge. So if you were to analyze the galaxy rotation, the gas and dust and stars on the outer edges of the galaxy should actually revolve slower around the galaxy than the stuff near the center because the center has more mass and this stuff is further away. If the galaxy were made 100% of normal, ordinary, illuminated matter. So that's, in, that's intuition. We would expect the velocity of the orbiting stars, gas and dust, to decrease as you get further out. However, Vera Rubin didn't observe that. What she observed by analyzing the rotations of galaxies, like Andromeda, is that as you got further and further out, the velocity of the orbiting gas and dust actually remained constant as you got further out. So here's a curve of the velocity versus the distance. This is what we would expect in a normal Keplerian system like our solar system. In other words, the velocity decreases as you get further out. What Rubin observed was that as you got further out, the velocity actually remained constant, or in some cases, as in the case of triangulum, it actually increased slightly. So what that means is that the, the galaxies were rotating too fast in order to hold themselves together if they were made of ordinary illuminated matter. If these galaxies were all 100% illuminated matter, they would actually fly apart. Our solar system is located off the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy. If our galaxy were made 100% of illuminated ordinary matter, our solar system should fly off into space because we're moving too fast around the galaxy. Scientists have analyzed hundreds of galaxies, spirals, ellipticals, irregulars, and they all find the same pattern. The, gal the galaxies rotate too fast for their own good, they should fly apart, and they need something else to hold them together. And what that something else is, is an invisible halo of dark matter that is not seen, only indirectly detected. And in fact, most of the mass of a galaxy is actually from the dark matter. The ordinary matter that makes us up, that makes our universe up, that we see with our five senses, we, we experience with our five senses, is actually incidental. It's a very small fraction of what actually exists. The bulk of the mass of a galaxy is in the dark matter, and the ordinary matter actually forms within the central region of the dark matter halo. We know that now. So, Obi-Wan Kenobi, the force is what gives the Jedi its power, it surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. George Lucas was onto something here, but it's not some mysterious energy field created by living things, it's actually dark matter that holds the universe together. So that's the Star Wars one. Now, these guys here, Peebles and Ostriker, did another measurement, or another experiment, that further move the case forward for the existence of dark matter. What these guys did is they actually did a, a detailed computer simulation called an n-body simulation of how a galaxy forms. And what you do is you have different individual particles and you do, um, you do a computer simulation of how one particle interacts gravitationally with another one and then you scale that up to hundreds and then eventually thousands of particles where each particle is like a star. So what they found in 1973 was that the spiral and elliptical galaxy structures that we see could not exist or could not form by ordinary matter alone. So what, happened, what they found was that if you ran a simulation forward, that the, uh, the bulk of the matter would actually, instead of forming a, a, an elegant spiral or elliptical galaxy, it would actually all the matter would actually kind of coalesce and form a, a long bar-like structure. So, in order to get the galaxy structures that we see through their formation, there has to be some additional mass in the model in order to make it work. When they introduced a static uniform distribution of mass three to ten times greater than the ordinary mass, then the simulation actually produced the types of structures that we see. 
with spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. So their discovery was interesting because what they showed with detailed computer modeling was that we cannot get the types of galaxies that we see. Those types of galaxies would not be able to form without additional dark matter, a lot of dark matter. So now, as far as actually detecting dark matter, where it is and what its effect is, this is the most detailed or the most um, comprehensive uh, look at, or the most comprehensive technique for finding dark matter. It's called gravitational lensing. Einstein's general theory of relativity, matter bends space and time. So the curvature of space and time will actually affect how light travels across the universe. So gravitational lensing, especially when you have large amounts of mass, like clusters of galaxies, the light from a distant galaxy or a distant quasar will actually be bent around this curvature on its path to Earth. So we will actually see this effect. And here's an example. A black hole, for instance, has a large amount of mass. And if you have a distant galaxy in the background, and, it, and uh, the black hole is in the line of sight of that galaxy, it will actually lens the light of that galaxy, just like your glasses lens light when you put them on your face. Your glasses bend the light rays, and that's how you're able to see. Same type of effect in space. So some examples of gravitational lensing. Here's an Einstein cross. You have a distant quasar billions of light years away. This is actually one object that's bent around the curvature of space and, and time due to the presence of large amounts of mass. So you see five different points here instead of just one point because the light is being bent around the, uh, the curvature of space and time. You see two or three different objects instead of just one. Another example of uh, gravitational lensing would be a ring-like structure. So this is what we call it an Einstein ring. This happens when a distant object uh, lens galaxy and observer telescope are perfectly aligned. So if you have a perfect alignment of a large presence of mass and then a distant galaxy or quasar, you can get this effect. And this is an example of what an Einstein ring would look like. Distant amount of mass and then the light is actually curved around the curvature of space and time. And um, this is what, this is another example of gravitational lensing. You have a galaxy cluster similar to the coma cluster where you have hundreds or even thousands of galaxies. And you have a large amount of dark matter that's invisible, it's not seen, it's not, um, you can't directly detect it. But we know it exists because it's bending the light and it's creating these arc-like structures. All these arc-like structures that you see here in this cluster of galaxies is actually being caused by gravitational lensing due to the presence of dark matter. So gravitational lensing is the smoke and gun that actually proves that dark matter exists. So this is how we know that dark matter exists. And we can actually create detailed three-dimensional maps of dark matter. Scientists are doing this right now through the Hubble Space Telescope. We not only know that dark matter exists, but we can see how dark matter is distributed in its position on the sky. We can see where it is, we can see how it forms, how it clusters, and uh, we can do this uh, through gravitational lensing. We can create detailed maps of where dark matter exists in the universe and how it's distributed. And galaxy clusters, large bodies of matter, are, um, are the best place to look for this because there's so much mass concentrated gravitationally in a certain area. So an example of this is Pandora's cluster. You can see here each discrete point of light is actually a distant galaxy. So this is the illuminated mass that makes up this galaxy cluster. Now when we do a detailed image you can see 5% of this cluster is actually illuminated mass that makes up the galaxies. Another 20% is uh, interstellar gas that you can detect with x-rays. You can see that from the red parts of this image right here. And the rest of this, 75%, is actually dark matter, represented by these blue areas here. So the majority of the matter in this cluster of galaxies is dark matter. And we know that because of gravitational lensing. So these are the kinds of 
maps or the kinds of imaging that we're able to do now because of gravitational lensing. So this is what it would actually look like if it were all visible. The bulk of it is dark matter. The rest of it is either is uh, some form of cold interstellar gas. And then, you know, we got a few leftovers here that actually make up stars, planets, galaxies, people, and computers, and all the stuff that we experience every day. Now, here's where it gets interesting. We can perform detailed computer simulations to show how dark matter is actually distributed throughout the universe. It's like a cosmic web. Think of dark matter as the scaffolding that holds the universe together. Just like you have steel girders on a building where you form a skeleton or a structure that eventually you attach the rest of the structure together. Same kind of thing is true in our universe. Dark matter forms long strands, kind of like a web. And that web has gravitationally the, um, the effect of causing ordinary matter to clump and coalesce and come together under the force of gravity. So it's the gravitational force of dark matter that causes ordinary matter to come together and form structure. You and I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for dark matter. Because dark matter has this nurturing force that somehow brings ordinary matter together to form galaxies and then eventually to form stars and then planets and more detailed structure. So dark matter is the scaffolding, the structure, and the sculpturing of of the ordinary universe. So in each one of these clumps is where ordinary matter coalesces. And these long strands here, we actually have detailed maps now showing how dark matter is distributed throughout the universe thanks to detailed simulations of the cosmic microwave background. So what is dark matter? We know it exists. We can infer its existence indirectly through these techniques, gravitational lensing, detailed computer simulations of how galaxies form, the galaxy rotation problem of Vera Rubin, and also Fritz Wicke. So we know it exists, but what the heck is dark matter? Is it ordinary matter that we just don't see yet? I mean, if you look deep into the sky, maybe you just don't see everything. It could be a lot of additional gas and dust, or uh, planets and stars that just don't emit a lot of light. Or is it something else? So here's what happened. Scientists and astronomers <coughs> took an inventory of all the stuff that exists in the universe and then sort of did a profile of each piece to see if it actually fit the definition or the description of what they thought dark matter would be. And they went through a list of different candidates for dark matter. One of them is, obvi you know, one, one obvious candidate would be black holes. They're compact objects, they have a very strong gravitational field. It's a collapsed star, no light can escape. And uh, they're detected through gravitational lensing. And, and uh, they exist in the halos of galaxies. So maybe dark matter is just a bunch of black holes that aren't directly seen yet. And so they thought about this, and they did experimentation on it, and it turns out there just simply are not enough black holes to account for all the dark matter in the universe. The bulk of the matter, we know, is dark matter, 85%. So there aren't enough black holes to account for the amount of mass or the amount of matter that we're seeing. So black holes are out. What about macho? Massive compact halo objects, which are basically dark, small stars. <coughs> the majority of the stars in our universe are either red dwarfs or brown dwarfs. When you look up at the sky at night, on a clear night, you can see our Milky Way galaxy. You'll see somewhere between two and 5,000 stars if you're in a really, really dark sky. The majority of those stars are larger than our sun. However, the majority of the stars that actually exist in our galaxy are much, much smaller than our sun. And they're called red dwarfs or brown dwarfs. The majority of the stars that exist are just these dark, Small stars that are just a little bit larger than Jupiter, but they don't emit a lot of light. So those are machos. We thought that, astronomers thought that maybe the dark matter is just a lot of machos that exist in the halos of galaxies that we're just not seeing. But just like, um, and they, they emit little or no radiation. However, once again, there aren't enough machos to account for the amount of dark matter that we're seeing. 
So it could be a possible dark matter candidate, but it, there just simply aren't enough of them. Same thing is true with brown dwarfs. There are just not enough brown dwarfs to account for all the dark matter in the universe. So we're going through one object after another and considering whether it's a candidate. And it's just simply, it's not a fit. So we went big at first. Black holes, machos, failed stars. What if we went smaller? What if we went to subatomic particles? And maybe it's just, maybe dark matter is just some form of particle in the particle physics world that either hasn't been detected yet or, um, yeah, just hasn't been detected yet. So axions is another possible dark matter candidate. They were invented back in 1977 to try and solve a problem in one of the particle physics theories. Um, they, they haven't been directly detected yet. They were believed to have been created at the Big Bang, the, the moment of origin in the universe. They have a very low mass, thousands, I, I've read as much as trillions of times smaller than an electron. They move very, very fast. They, uh, they don't interact with ordinary matter, and they're very numerous. The universe is filled with axions. So maybe the thinking is that the dark matter is just a bunch of axions. However, experimentation has shown that axions would likely change characteristics. They would change to photons in the presence of a strong magnetic field. Dark matter is stable. It doesn't change. So axions don't really fit the description of what dark matter is or should be. There are detailed experiments going on right now to detect axions and to prove that they exist. But the signature, the footprint of what an axion is, doesn't really fit the description of what dark matter should be. So axions don't really fit the description. What about neutrinos? We know that neutrinos exist. Every second, 10 trillion solar neutrinos are streaming through this room. They come from nuclear processes within the sun, as well as exploding stars deep within space. Very abundant, very light, 4 million times lighter than an electron. Very high energy particle. My favorite statement about neutrinos, if you want to get an idea of how small these things are, if you were to shine a beam of neutrinos through a block of light, one, uh, through a block of lead, one light year thick, six trillion miles thick, more than half of those neutrinos would pass through that block of lead unscathed. So they're very, very light, they're very, very fast moving, and they don't interact with ordinary matter at all. So, the thinking was, after they were discovered, that maybe it's neutrinos. Maybe dark matter is neutrinos and we're done. However, there's not enough mass to account for, they're not massive enough to account for what dark matter should be. And they're also moving too fast. They move at a significant fraction of the speed of light. And in order for structure to form, dark matter should be more massive and it should be slower moving. And Neutrinos don't really fit that characteristic or, or that description. So neutrinos don't really, they're not, they're not the type of particle, subatomic particle, that would describe what we would see with non-baryonic dark matter. So the conclusion after doing an inventory of all the stuff in the universe, the big stuff, the small stuff, is that all the stuff that you can construct from ordinary matter Atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, neutrinos, whatever, cannot possibly enough be enough to account for all the mass in the universe. Dark matter is made of some new, yet-to-be-discovered particle that hasn't been detected yet. That's the conclusion. Now, the most popular thinking or theory for what a dark matter particle is, is something called a <coughs> wimp. It's not a macho, it's a wimp. It's all about the wimps. Wimps are weakly interacting massive particles. They haven't been discovered yet, but their characteristics fit the model of what the perfect dark matter candidate should be. Wimps are massive particles that move slower, about a thousand times slower than the speed of light. And it's a brand new, yet to be discovered particle that doesn't interact very well with ordinary matter. We only know, we would only know that wimps exist gravitationally. They don't, they don't interact with light, 
They don't interact with electromagnetically. They don't interact with a strong or weak nuclear force. Only gravity. So, they haven't been detected yet, and there are, there are literally experiments going on all over the world right now to try and find or prove that these things exist. So, WIMPs. Now, given our observation of distant galaxies in terms of how they form and how they rotate in a cluster, we can deduce that our Milky Way galaxy has an invisible halo of dark matter that surrounds it, evenly distributed matter composed of wimps. So if this is the galactic plane and this is the galactic bulge and our Earth is somewhere on the edge, there should literally be a large amount, a large halo of invisible dark matter that surrounds our galaxy. And as our solar system moves through our galaxy, and rotates around the galactic center, it passes through what's called a wimp wind. In other words, we're passing through a galactic halo of invisible dark matter right now. And as I'm talking to you, wimps are streaming through this room. And they're not interacting with any, any, any ordinary matter at all. They're just passing through us. They're passing through our bodies, pass, passing through the, the matter that makes up this room. And it's just passing through us. And it should be coming from the, from the direction of the constellation Cygnus, because that's that's the direction that our galaxy is rotating. So, it's like an invisible man passing through walls. Here's Earth, here's a stream of dark matter passing right through the Earth and not interacting at all with ordinary matter. If that's happening, then we should be able to set up experiments to detect the existence of wind particles and prove that dark matter exists. So here's what's happening. It's called the cryogenic dark matter search. And this began a little over a decade ago. The first experiments were conducted at the Stanford University. There was a tunnel underneath the campus of the Stanford University. And they did some experiments to try and, de and detect wimp collisions with ordinary matter. It then moved to Sudan, Minnesota. And now it's, there's an advanced effort going on called the Super CDMS, cryogenic dark matter search that uses more advanced silicon detectors to, that are more sensitive than the detectors that they were using before. So how does this work? Cryogenic dark matter search. Here's an abandoned mine. It used to be an iron ore mine that was abandoned in 1962. It's in northern Minnesota, and it's hundreds of miles from any city lights. But instead of looking up to find dark matter, you actually go underground to find dark matter. You go a half a mile underground and you convert that iron ore mine. This was developed back in the 1980s. They took this abandoned iron ore mine and they, con they converted it into a research facility. And this is where particle physicists are now conducting detailed, sensitive experiments to try and find dark matter. Here's the team. So here's how it works. The reason why you want to go underground is because there's a lot of junk in the air that would introduce noise into the experiment. There's hundreds, there's a hundred cosmic rays that are passing through each square meter of Earth per second. You go a hundred mile underground, the rock and the structure of the Earth will actually shield your experiments from cosmic rays that are coming in. However, wimps should be passing right on through the Earth. So if they're doing that, then you can, you can set up your experiments down here to detect wimps without any interference from cosmic rays, neutrons, and background radiation from uh, the Earth's crust, from the Earth's surface. So you get a half a mile underground, you set up a detailed experiment, and then you look for wind particles. That's how you find dark matter. That's what's going on. Now here's what the detectors look like. You set up a uh, what's called a hockey puck sized chunk of germanium. Germanium is a dense metal. You can form semiconductors out of it. It's one of the materials that, uh, that we use to form electronic chips. So it's either made of silicon or germanium. It's jam-packed with atoms. And you have uh, you know, a six inch um, hockey puck size chunk of germanium. And it has little sensors on it. And what these little sensors do is they detect a change in an impact. So if, if, if um, 
these sensors are going to, 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 to detect if there's an impact with the nucleus of one of these atoms, and it will, it will produce a vibration. So these sensors are hooked up electronically, and you can see kind of how it's laid out. Here's the sensor, and then here's one little section of this sensor, which is like a transistor on a computer chip. And um, it gives information about how the particles that are passing through the sensor are interacting. Now, if one of these wind particles bumps into the nucleus of a germanium atom, there will be a recoil. It's like billiard balls on a pool table. And that recoil is called a phonon. And that's what, this sensor, that's what this sensor is set up to do. Detect when a wind particle will bump into the nucleus of an atom. So it's a vibration. It also detects if there's a charge, which is a, uh, there's a metal grid on this sensor that detects that there's a change in the electronic charge that was displaced within the crystal by an incoming particle. So when particles hit the germanium atom, these sensors tell you what type of particle hit the, uh, the atom. And that's how we find dark matter. Now you take these silicon crystal or these silicon um, hockey puck size sensors and you stack them six deep and you put them inside of a chamber and then you cool them. They're cooled to near absolute zero, which is 0 0.02 degrees Kelvin. And um, the reason why you want to cool them is because you want to eliminate any thermal noise. The vibration of atoms introduces noise into the experiment. So by freezing it to sub-zero temperatures, and the idea is to get as close to no molecular movement as possible, then you're eliminating any noise from the background. So you have these sensors, you stack them 60, you put them into a chamber, you cool them to near absolute zero, and you wait for particles to pass through them and bump into the nucleus of an atom. So dark matter is passing through Earth right now, streaming through us. Very occasionally, one of these dark matter particles will actually bump into the nucleus of a germanium atom, and there will be a slight change in the temperature. And the sensors on that sensor will actually pick up that slight change in temperature. And that's the signature that scientists are looking for right now to prove that wind dark matter exists. <coughs> Tiny change in the, in the, uh, in the uh, germanium or the, the crystal as the particle passes through. Here's a uh, sample of what the data might look like. So you see here, you got a lot of different types of data. So the purple dots here on the right side, they would actually represent photons. And you know this, of course, is not dark matter. It's ordinary light. The green dots over here would be stray electrons. The smoking gun or the signature that scientists are looking for are impacts that look like neutrons. We know that when dark matter doesn't have an electric charge, neutral charge, similar to a neutron. So anything that impacts and looks like it could be a neutron is a candidate for cold dark matter. So the reason is because you're far, you're far underground, wimps would behave like neutrons underneath the ground because there shouldn't be any neutrons passing that far underground. So in the Sudan there should be almost no neutrons around since we are deep underground. So anything which looks like a neutron is likely to be a wind particle. So we're looking for stuff that looks like the red dot in the simulation, <coughs> not either the purple or the green dots. So it should, it should behave, it should, be, it should produce a vibration or a recoil <coughs> and not a change in an electric charge if it is a, a, uh, a wind dark matter particle. Now, how often does this happen? Every second, five million wimps will pass through a two kilogram piece of normal matter containing 10 to the 25 atoms. However, one wimp will hit the nucleus of an atom one time in an entire year. So the probability of a wimp particle hitting the nucleus of a germanium atom is very, very low. To put this in perspective, the probability of one particle hitting the nucleus of a germanium atom would be like an archer shooting a bow and arrow and hitting the bullseye of a target that's more than a mile away. So this is something that doesn't happen very often. 
Scientists are literally conducting these experiments daily. They go to the lab, they run their experiments, they run their simulations, they play games of ping pong and bingo, and then they analyze the data, and they get nowhere. And this has been going on now for over a decade. So, Fermilab has been searching for dark matter for over a decade, and no wind particles have been detected to date. That's where we are. 96% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. We can infer its, its existence indirectly, but we don't have any tangible proof that it actually exists. However, this past April, this article surfaced on the web. Researchers may have finally detected a dark matter particle from this source. Now scientists with the International Super Cryogenic Dark Matter Search, CMS experiment, are reporting the detection of a particle that's thought to make up dark matter, a weakly interacting mass of particle or wind. According to a press release from Texas A&M University's high-energy particle physicist Rupak Mahapatra is a principal investigator in the experiment. Super CMS has identified a wind-like signal at the three-signal level, which indicates a 99.8% chance of an actual discovery, <coughs> a concrete hint, as he's being called, 99.8%, three sigma. However, Although Mahapatra says this result is certainly encouraging and worthy of further investigation, he cautions, it should not be considered a discovery yet. We are only 99.8% sure. We want to be 99.99999% sure. At three sigma, you have a hint of something. At four sigma, you have evidence. At five sigma, you have a discovery. So, in medicine, you can say you are 99.8% sure that you're going to cure a case. That's okay. But when you say you've made a fundamental discovery in high energy physics, you can't be wrong. So we're 99.8% sure, but we're still at three sigma level. We want to be 99.99999% sure before we can prove that this event is actually a wind particle. It's another example of how, as technology improves, as we get better with our equipment, more and more sensitive equipment, we can get closer to actually making a discovery. And that's what's happening right now. So Super CDMS <coughs> uses detectors which are more sensitive than the CDMS2 detectors. We're getting closer, but we're still not 100% sure that dark matter exists. But it's happening at the particle physics level. Now, you can have a little bit of fun with this. If the majority of the universe is made up of dark matter, does that mean that there could be planets, other worlds that are made up of dark matter, entirely of dark matter? Could there be dark life forms, plants? Could there be, could there be an entire periodic table of elements that's made up entirely of dark matter? This is purely, purely hypothetical, but if you go to the cutting edge of cosmology and physics today, the multi-worlds or the many-worlds hypothesis doesn't rule this out. In fact, there could be many, you know, multiple universes and different dimensions that we don't sense. So, this is more science fiction than science fact, but it's kind of fun to think about. I don't think so, because if you look at how dark matter is distributed, it's more uniform, it's more spread out, it doesn't really clump together and coalesce to form structure like ordinary matter does. It's more, it, it helps, it assists gravitationally in bringing ordinary matter together to form structure. But itself, it doesn't really do that. So the, the probability of something like this is very, very low. So, conclusions. Dark matter is thought to be some mysterious new particle beyond the reach of our direct detection. We haven't discovered it yet. We have a hypothesis, which is basically a guess. We think it's a wimp. We think dark matter is made up of weakly interacting massive particles. We're getting close to proving that that's the case, but we're not there yet. Mankind is not only not the center of the universe, but we're not, we're, we've come a long way in 500 years. From Copernicus's time, proving that the geocentric model of the universe is fundamentally wrong, to not only are we not the center of the universe, but we're not even made up of the same stuff for the most part that the universe is made up of. The atoms and molecules that make up our bodies and all the structure that we see, those are just a few of the leftovers. 
Everything else is this mysterious dark matter. However, dark matter is fundamental to our understanding of the universe. How it formed, how it, uh, its structure, how it's expanding, and uh, ultimately where we're heading. So this is, you know, understanding the nature of dark matter, understanding what it is, and understanding its origin is fundamental to understanding the universe, its structure, and ultimately where we're going. So this is cutting edge. This is um this would be groundbreaking if we ever get to the point where we discover dark matter and what it is. But it's still very more unknown in terms of its nature than what's known. We see it indirectly, we infer its existence, but we don't have tangible proof yet that it actually exists. And that's it. That's my talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Lots, of, lots of questions, but is WIMP part of the standard model of particle physics? No, it isn't. It's non-baryonic in nature. So it's not made up, of, at its constituent level, it's not made up of the same fundamental subatomic particles, particles that ordinary matter is made up. A WIMP is something totally different. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, WIMPs would not make up elements like you would see in the normal uh, periodic table. It's a, it's a completely new particle uh, that fundamentally in nature is very different from any other particle of matter. So it doesn't, it doesn't interact electromagnetically. It doesn't interact with a strong or weak nuclear force. The only interaction that we see with WIMPs would be gravitationally. So it's not part of the standard part of the physics model. So it's not charmed or anything like that? No, there's no charge. It's neutral. Charm. Oh, charm. C-H-A-R-M? Yeah. Yeah, no. It's something totally different. Yes? Do you think that the dark matter is more or less evenly distributed throughout the universe? It sounds like from what you said, it's associated with the visible matter and acts sort of like the matrix that it assembles on. So. It seems like it would be concentrated in galaxies or close to them or within clusters of galaxies, but not in the big uh, intergalactic uh, spaces. It seems like it would not be there. Is that yeah, correct? it depends on the scale. On the large intergalactic scale that you're talking about, it's not uniformly distributed because it has a tendency to cluster around um, you know, where ordinary matter is. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's the other way around. Yeah. The dark matter is causing the ordinary matter to cluster. Sort of. So, however, on a small scale, like our galaxy, mm -hmm. it's uniformly distributed. It is associated, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. The dark matter is running the show. It's causing ordinary matter to cluster and form and uh, create structure. Um, but it's, yes, yes. On a large scale, it's not uniformly distributed, but on a smaller scale, it is. So we know a lot about it for not knowing anything about it. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It's, 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 science is a very interesting thing because, you know, there's a part of it that's direct. We want to know the answers, right? We want to perform experiments and uh, have a linear path from what we think or what we test and what we actually can prove. But the majority of science doesn't behave that way, as you know. A lot of it is indirect. You know, and in the case of dark matter, we don't understand its nature. We think we do. We have a hypothesis for understanding, you know, the model and the fundamental nature of it, but we don't have tangible proof yet. But we know that it exists because we see its effect. And this is only one theory. I mean, there's other theories out there for what dark matter could be. One of them is modified Newtonian dynamics, MOND, which means maybe we don't understand gravity completely. Maybe we need to go back and and open the hood under Newton's laws of gravity and modify them a little bit. Maybe dark matter isn't mass, but it's actually a property of matter that hasn't been dis you know, discovered yet. And then there's another theory that maybe dark matter is just the gravitational influence of ordinary matter in another dimension or another universe. But those are just kind of, that's more science fiction than fact. The most popular idea is still the wind hypothesis. What are the questions? I'm not familiar with baryonic. Oh, baryonic and non, okay. Baryonic matter at its constituent level is, is composed of three quarks. And it makes oh, up okay. 
protons and neutrons, which is the bulk of the particles that make up atoms. So bari there's baryonic matter, and then there's non-baryonic matter. So examples of baryonic matter would be like protons and neutrons, and then non-baryonic matter would be electrons, neutrinos, and WIMPs, weakly, massive, weakly interactive, weakly interactive massive particles. So yeah, we call it non-baryonic matter. So if it's got mass, it's baryonic. Well, at its constituent level, well, that mass is made up of quarks. But the WIMPs have mass. The WIMPs have mass. They interact gravitationally, but they're made of something fundamentally different. It's mm -hmm. non-baryonic in nature. So the fundamental building blocks of WIMPs are totally different than the fundamental building blocks of baryonic matter, like protons mm -hmm. and neutrons. There's baryons and then there's leptons. Those are the two classes of, uh, in the particle physics world. So baryons would be like protons and neutrons. Leptons would be like electrons and neutrinos. And then you've got the WIMPs. So it's just, it's particle physics stuff. You, you know, there's, there's several levels in this. But um, yeah. Okay. Um, we know that uh, regular matter and energy are interconvertible. Mm -hmm. Matter going into energy and vice versa. Is there any reason to believe that dark matter takes part in that, either directly back and forth between dark matter, dark matter and regular matter? Is there an matter, e equals or, mc squared between or, dark matter and dark yeah, matter? Or through energy uh, as an intermediate. Is there any reason to believe that happens? Or is, you said earlier it was stable and sort of fixed, but uh, you, know, you implied that it doesn't interconvert. It's stable and fixed. Another experiment for detecting dark matter is through WIMP collisions, WIMPs with other WIMPs. So what the, the experiment that I just showed you was WIMPs colliding with ordinary matter. A WIMP particle bumps into a germanium nucleus and there's a recoil and you measure that. Another experiment is actually you look at distant galaxies like um, low, you look at um, older galaxies that don't emit much light, they're, uh, they're low surface, they're, they're, they're uh, but anyway, in those galaxies, you look for gamma rays. And the reason is because if you have a wind particle that meets another wind particle, those two will collide and annihilate each other and emit a gamma ray. So that's another source, potential source, to prove that dark matter exists. So in that case where you have two dark, we have two uh, wind particles colliding with each other, they annihilate each other almost like matter and antimatter, and they give off energy. It would be similar to what you were talking about. Now, taking that a step further, could dark matter and dark energy be related? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think we're that far yet in the discovery. Um, dark energy is something totally different. We call it dark energy, but it's really a bad name. Dark energy is really the term for, we don't know what the hell's going on. We just know that the universe is expanding like crazy. And so, expanding at an accelerated rate. At an accelerated rate. Yeah, that's a topic for another talk. Yeah. Um, the more space you have between galaxies, it's a property of space itself. Space is not complete nothingness. There's actually this mysterious energy that's causing the more distant galaxies to fly further away from us, and it's speeding up, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like counterintuitive, because if you have all this mass in the universe that's made up of, of uh, galaxies, and then you have all this dark matter, gravity is an attractive force. So if the universe is expanding, its rate of expansion should be slowing with time because gravity is pulling on it. And that's what we expected to find. We know the universe is accelerating because Hubble showed that back in 29. However, what we didn't know until about 10 years ago was that it's not only expanding, but that, that, that the rate of expansion is speeding up with time. And that's where this dark energy principle comes in. So what's causing that? What is dark energy? We still don't know. It's the greatest mystery right now. It's even, it's, even, it's even greater mystery than, than dark matter. Yes? You know, I know when they were searching for the Higgs boson, which they're still looking for, they can put a bunch of things into a particle accelerator and fire them at each other and create one. Uh -huh. Is there anything like that for a WIMP? Do they have figured yes. out a way to create WIMPs? They're doing that at Hadron Colliders right now, too. They're smashing particles together in an attempt to either create WIMPs or directly, uh, <coughs> yeah, find WIMPs. So they're doing, yes, it's another experiment that's going on. But it hadn't worked yet. What's that? It hadn't worked yet. It hasn't worked yet, no. No, 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 no. 
There is a multi-pronged attack going on right now. Several different experiments. Underground, like we just showed with CDMS. In particle colliders, like what you're talking about. Even axions, they're still trying to prove that that could be the possible dark matter. Although I don't think it fits the description of what dark matter is. And then of course, looking up in the sky. So yes, the short answer to your question is there are experiments like that going on. 